Hey, welcome to Fruitland Christian Fellowship. I am Chuck Reesh, one of the pastors here. Uh, today's message, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the mockers that will be in last time, Jude. Uh, it's only one chapter, but it's verses 17 and 19 through 19. And we're back to the life of the Messiah and harmony of the Gospels. The shepherd knows his sheep. Uh, we're going to be in John chapter 10, verses 22 to 39. So we're going to pray. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to gather and look at your word and also see what's happening in the world. And we pray you give us wisdom, guidance, direction, show us how to, how to be Christ-like, like you, Lord Jesus. We know ultimately that's the goal, that we're transformed into the image of your Son. Uh, help us submit and surrender in every area of our lives according to your will, for your glory. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, so I don't know if you guys brought your Bibles today, but uh, in Jude, chapter 17, sorry, verse 17 through 19, is this verse. But you, beloved, remember the words which are spoken by the apostles and spoken before by the apostles, our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. Verse 19, these are sensual persons who cause division, not having the Spirit. And that's capital S, that would be the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So this is the world. So even in verse 19, look at sensual. That, world, that word can also mean worldly. And uh, there's another third word. And it's not a common word that we wouldn't use, but it's worldly, sensual. And uh, for those who might have been following the opening Olympics on Friday, there was a lot of transgender, very much naked people reenacting the Last Supper that Leonardo da Vinci painted. He wasn't there, obviously, <laughs> 2,000 years ago at the Last Supper. And all of them weren't on one side of the table. The table was more like a U-shape and where a servant would be able to come in and be able to serve all the people around the table and then come out. So it wasn't this long table with everybody on one side. Again, it's an artist depiction, but it was kind of blasphemous. A lot of Christians were upset about it. But for me, you know, it's an opportunity to talk about well, really what happened at the Last Supper. Since you brought it up, maybe, you know, 8 billion people on the planet right now. I know there's 2 billion people that haven't heard of the name of Jesus. All in the 1040 window, it's kind of the Middle East. There's still a lot of people that haven't even heard the gospel that there was a death and a resurrection three days later. But the night before he died and how he you know, took bread, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body, it's gonna be broken for you. And then he took the cup and said, this is my cup of the new covenant, which is my blood, which is shed for the remission of many. Not everybody, but many. And those many are the ones who believe. So that's what he was instituting at the last Passover that Jesus, Messiah, Yeshua, participated in, brought in a whole new covenant and the Messianic covenant or the Mosaic covenant, I would say, that was brought into play from Moses was a better covenant now in the blood of Jesus. No longer do we require the blood of, out, uh, of animals, lambs, pigeons for the atonement of sin. All the ceremonial laws, dietary laws were fulfilled but sexual immorality is still very much in effect. And what we see in a demonstration of after Pride Month of June is that the whole world, the Olympics, did a demonstration. But it's, it's the world. Every nation is represented there, right? It's the world. If you have your Bibles, I want you to open the first John chapter 5. We're going to look at verse 4 and 5. So don't be surprised when you see the world sinning or even mocking what we would believe is sacred. It's going to get worse. So I just, I don't, this isn't really our study. We're getting into the life of the Messiah. And again, we're going to be in John chapter 10, where Jesus himself was going toe to toe with religious leaders on whether the issue of whether he was really the Messiah or not. And in John chapter 8, verse 31, he spoke to the Jews who did believe in him. And he says, if you abide in my word, you'll be my disciples, you'll know the truth, the truth will set you free. So there was already a lot of Jews who did believe in him, but there were still some religious leaders, the Pharisees specifically, who did not believe his claim to be Messiah. And we're going to watch him going toe-to-toe -to -toe with religious leaders who didn't understand that Jesus is the Messiah. So the world, there's still a lot of people who don't get it, and it's our job to help them get it. Not argue, not insult them, not, you know, bruise fruit. We're called to bear fruit. 
right? So that's what this verse is. Judas, Judas half, is his half-brother of Jesus. This is one of the four brothers mentioned in Mark chapter 6, verses 3. That he had four brothers and some sisters, so it's at least two or more. So after Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph consummated the marriage. She conceived and had at least six plus more children. So we know that by the text of eyewitnesses who were there. John was there. He's the one who took Mary in until she died. He took care of her after Jesus died on the cross. He gave his, his stewardship as the firstborn to John, the, the steward. And he mentions all this. So he doesn't mention that Mary was forever a virgin, like the Catholic denomination thinks. And it's OK. They could be wrong about some things. I know I'm wrong about some things, but I'm not wrong about the scriptures, right? So anyway, when you see the world do what the world does, 1 John 5, 4, what does that verse say? It says, whoever's born of God overcomes the world, right? So not everybody is born of God. If you're born, in, born again, born of the Spirit, you're born of God. If you're not, you're not. And today is the day. It could be your day. We're not, you know, there's still room in the body of Christ for you today. If you've not made Jesus Christ Lord of your life and invited him in, and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Today is your day. So I want you to keep listening and think about some of the things that we're talking about. But 1 John 5, there's a lot in this whole book. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world is our faith. Our faith isn't in everything and anything. Our faith is very specific into the Son of God who died for me, who rose again. That's who I'm living for. That's who paid for my sin. That's my Lord and my Savior. That's my leader. And if there ever were aliens and they ever visited and they said, take me to your leaders, I'd have to introduce them to Jesus. <laughs> and they would probably already know him too, because he's created everything. Uh, and it's probably angels or even demons. We've done a study on that. So there is no such thing as, in tech, you know, demons and, uh, sorry, aliens from another galaxy. We know by just mere physics, it's impossible for them to travel that far and still be alive. And uh, it's just nobody can travel the speed of light and still live, and it's just impossible. And if they did, they wouldn't be here for two and a half minutes and then leave. They'd be probably hanging out for a few months, at least. <laughs> I know when I go on a cruise, it's not for two and a half minutes when I get on the island and get back on the cruise ship and go back home, right? Anybody go on a cruise? Anybody take a plane trip somewhere? Did you get off, say hi, give them a hug, and get back on the plane and leave? No, and that's just, you know, cross country. So think about the aliens. If they really did visit, why would they only here for a few seconds and then take off? We talked about that. Right, Jerry? All right, so enough of that. So we're getting back into the harmony of the gospel. So, um, and even, just even verse, verse four in that chapter, verse one in that chapter, John five, verse one, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ, a.k.a. Messiah, is born of God. So that's who's starting to clarify who's an overcomer, who's, who's a believer, and that's what we believe. And that's, because God has proven it to us in a lot of different ways. So last week's, message was on faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. We know that the word of God is testimony of people in them. We have testimonies, our own personal testimonies. And the more we hear about God working in our lives, it increases our faith and our trust and our belief in him that he's still working and he wants to continue working in your life. So just be open to the idea that God wants to make some changes. Amen? Amen. All right, part two of the message, the life of the Messiah, harmony of the gospels. We're in sections 113. And I should be telling you this every time. There's actually... Turn off the Okay. So, as far as the harmony of the Gospels, we're looking at uh, this book. It's written by A.T. Robertson. And, and they've taken all four Gospels, and there's 198 sections. So every teaching, every event, whether it lines up in one, two, three, or all four Gospels, it's a chronological order of the text with no conjecture, no commentary. It's just scripture. One, two, three, four, all the way through from front to cover, and it's in section order. So they broke it down into every event, every teaching. And if you have your study Bibles right at the beginning um, that we've handed out, right at the beginning there is a harmony of the Gospels, and you can tell it's all Luke. It's chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, all the way to the end. And the other Gospels pepper in, in and out of chronological order. So that's what we're doing. So this is the last section of this 1, uh, 99 through 112. The motif uh, is that there was a division. So there was basically a conflict of the, at the feast of dedication. This is uh, what they would call Hanukkah. It's not the feast of lights. 
It's, uh, that's another thing, but the Feast of Dedication is what traditionally would be called Hanukkah. It was in December, and uh, it's John chapter 10, verse 22 to 39. Jesus would, three times a year, go to the temple for the different, um, the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Dedication. Uh, uh, John a blank on the three different feasts, but there was three required feasts throughout the year. Uh, but the dedication, with Passover, right? Yeah. And um, the Feast of Trumpets, which we just finished that one. They were expecting him to announce uh, his Messiahship, and he'd already done that. But the Feast of Dedication wasn't really a required feast, but he shows up to this one in John chapter 22 to 39. And this is where... Uh, at the Feast of Dedication, verse 22, it says, you know, it was at the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter, and Jesus walked into the temple and the Solomon's porch, and the Jews surrounded him and said to him, how long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, a.k.a. Messiah, it's, it's what they're, again, that's our translation of Messiah as Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus, verse 25, answered him, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe me, because you are not of my sheep. As I told you, my sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Verse 28, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Verse 30, I and my Father are one. Mind blower. Again, talking to a Jewish audience in Deuteronomy, they know this. Moses said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Most every Jewish person to this day knows that verse. That's why a lot of them have a hard time with what we would call the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Because they're like, no, now you have three different gods. No, me, myself, and I is one person. Right? We've talked about this before. So it's a different manifestation of the Trinity. He's, but he's basically saying me and the Father are one. So, again, not to offend, but Jehovah Witnesses, have, they don't know what to do with this verse because they don't think Jesus is deity. Islam as well, they don't think God would have sex with a virgin nor would, a, would God die on the cross. So they really struggle with the Trinity concepts that we would have to believe by faith. And so here he's telling them plainly. So I just want to look at a couple things here. So, again, we went through the Sermon on the Mount, and in Matthew chapter 7... We're going to do some extra credit today. If you go to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7 is the end of the sermon where a lot of people will, he's talking about false prophets. Beware of false prophets in 18. They're prophesying false things like him not being the Messiah is one of them. And, and everybody seems to know this verse, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but they forget the second half of this verse, which is probably the most important. But he who does the will of my Father. That's who he's talking about here. My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. So if you receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you believe his blood paid for your sins, he knows you, you know him, and how do we know what the will of the Father is? So he tells us plainly, go to John chapter 6, verse 39 and 40. These are two of my favorite verses. This is the good news. This is the gospel. It's not a performance test. So you, I guarantee you, if you receive the Holy Spirit in you, you will start performing better. Sins will start falling off. You'll never be good enough. You'll never be perfect. You'll never deserve heaven based on your performance. It's always grace plus faith plus nothing equals salvation. But you shall perform better with the little help of the Holy Spirit. So verse 39 and 41 says what? This is the will of the Father. So couple that with Matthew 7. Not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but does who do the will of my Father. Well, what is the will of the Father? Verse 39, this is the will of the Father, 
that all that he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up on the last day. Verse 40, and this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I'll raise him up at the last day. So if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, he's Lord of all, he knows you, you know him, and he gives you eternal life. It's not temporary eternal life. We believe if you really settle this issue and you're really a believer, it's not temporary eternal life. You don't lose your salvation. He says, I give them eternal life. They shall what? Never perish. Good place to put in unless they keep doing that one thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. You know, they better straighten up, fly right. I, you know, my way or the, you know, or the highway. <laughs> you know, he says, they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. He didn't say you, because who is he talking to? He's talking to unbelievers. Tell us plainly, are you the Messiah? Which means you don't believe. And he just says it right there. I told you, yo, you do not believe. You don't believe in me. So either you do or you don't. And for those who like to try to share the gospel, you're not going to convert 10 out of 10 people. Jesus didn't. <laughs> so that takes you know, the pressure off of us to share who he is, what he said, what he did. You believe in him. Um, there's still some people who believe in Santa Claus until you kind of have to break the news to him. And there's a brand new movie coming out of that. Uh, I, mean, I saw some previews to movies yesterday. We went to go see Twister. And there's all these movies. And more and more of them just have so much special effects and pseudo worlds and, and fake this and that and special effects. It's like all this fantasy. When if we just focused on reality, it's pretty exciting. The real world that we live in is pretty exciting that we live in. So um, nothing against fiction. But I know what fiction is when I see it. right? And there's this old Saint Nick. He gets taken hostage and there's this, I think the rock has to go uh, find St. Nick. <laughs> and it's this whole futuristic movie. Anyway, I'm like, they're just coming up with stuff. If we just focus on the truth, we'll, we'll do a lot better. So at this point, verse 31, they're thinking this is blasphemy. So again, the last time he declared himself to be God, when he did a healing on the Sabbath, they said, you made yourself equal with God. They felt that was blasphemy and they were going to stone him. Verse 31, then the Jews who took up stones again to stone him, Jesus answered and said, many good works I have shown you from my father. Which one of those works do you stone me? Jesus answered and saying, and then Jews answered him saying, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy because you being a man make yourself God. Great time for Jesus to clarify. I'm sorry, did you misunderstand me? I'm just Lord. I'm not really God. Please drop your stones. It would be a good time to start backstepping and talk his way out of this. If there was a misunderstanding happening right now, you think he would start explaining it. But no, he lets it sit. He's like, right. <laughs> Basically, yeah, I am. You're looking at him, right? And a little fast forward, the night before the cross as well, after the Last Supper that was just blasphemed, when he says, I'm going to my father's house, I'm preparing a place for you, I'm going to come back and receive you there to myself, in my father's house and many mansions, don't let your heart be troubled, if you believe in God, believe also in me, right, I'm coming back, I'm going to receive you to myself, and he said, uh, you know the way, and he said, well, show us the way, and he says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, nobody comes to the father except through me, and he says, show us the father, he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the father, that's why he can say, nobody comes to the father except through me, because I'm him. You can't get to my house unless you go to my house. Not every house is my house. And again, God made it really easy for you to know the one way to go. Not, and Jared makes this point all the time. It's not like 50 other options. You've got to try to figure them all out and make your best educated decision. He makes it really easy for people. The one way to God is through God. And he manifested himself lived a sinless life nobody else has before, nobody else has since, which proves that he was the Messiah, the anointed one, the king, of, the king of kings, right? Verse 34, then Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I said you were gods, little g. 
And we've talked about this. Jared did a great study on Elohim. There's little Elohim. There's multiple gods Elohim. And then there's the, the Elohim above all Elohims. The, the God above all gods. There is none beside you. So there's the God, creator God, and there's other Elohims in the Bible. And a lot of Gentile teachers will think when they see that, they're thinking, oh, it must just be the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. No, there's a whole list of heavenly hosts in heaven. And if you'd want, we can direct you to a, 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 some studies on that. But um, anyway, so Jesus starts using the word here in the scriptures, in the law, you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scriptures can't be broken, do you say of him who the father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the son of God? If I do not do the works of my father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Super theological statement here. This is, again, a little bit of, but he's talking to a very well-educated group of Pharisees. These guys should know better. He's pulling out the word because they got a copy of it. Not everybody in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago had a scroll. We have more Bibles than we know what to do with at this point. We have them on our phones. We have six billion plus printed and published. It's not hard to get a copy of all the scriptures and read the full story, all of it. But they didn't have that. But these guys that he's talking to did. That's why he brings out the verse to them. Verse 39, therefore they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. So... Let's go to Philippians chapter 2. We read this Tuesday, uh, Wednesday night in our Bible study. And again, this is Saul who became the Apostle Paul. Saul of Tarsus for the first three to five years was pursuing the church after Jesus died, rose again, ascended to heaven. Saul is found in Acts chapter 7, approving to the stoning of Stephen, a disciple of Jesus, who gave them a, a big long speech about how Father gave them the Messiah, and they were the first one, the first believer in Jesus, the first martyr for the faith of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, it was in Acts chapter 7, and Saul was there, and he, they all took their coats off so they didn't get blood splattered on them. But if you thought, how many rocks would you have to throw at somebody before they would die? If we lined somebody outside a church today and everybody started picking up rocks and throwing them at this person, how many rocks do you think it would take to kill a person? Outside of one giant big boulder on his head, right? That would be a quick, and quick way to go. But throwing rocks at a person until they die is, probably takes a, a while. And everybody who's throwing rocks, blood is splatting at them. So they all put their coats to the side and Saul says, I'll keep an eye on the coats while you guys do the, the deed. But he approved of them martyring Stephen. And then later, James got his head cut off. And then Peter was in jail, getting ready to get his, his be assassinated. And an angel delivered him while everybody was in prayer for him and his deliverance. And God did deliver him. So anyway, all the other apostles wound up getting martyred and killed for their faith because they wouldn't stop shutting up about it. So anyway, the Saul sees Jesus in Acts chapter 9 on the road to Damascus. Jesus appears to him, and he becomes a believer. Everybody at this point is so scared of Saul that he has to change his name to Paul just to start hanging out with church members. And he starts going on about 20 years later, starts writing what we call the New Testament. So in Philippians chapter 2, he's writing to the church in Philippi, which is a group of people. It's not a building. And then he starts off, he says in verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery... To be equal with God. And that's what he's talking about right here. What did he just say? Me and the Father are one. And they're, they're saying, this is blasphemy. You're calling yourself, you're making yourself God. Right. And I'm not robbing him of any glory. He didn't consider it robbery to be considered equal with God. But being, in verse 8, being found in the appearance as a man, he, capital H, Every time you talk about deity, the New King James is good about that. If it's deity, the Messiah, or God, or the Holy Spirit, he always gets a capital. He, but 
made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance of a man, verse 8, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of a cross. Therefore, God has also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and those under the earth. That kind of sounds like hell to me. I'm not a theologian, but I've got people in heaven, I've got people on earth, and I've got people under the earth. That sounds like heaven, earth, and hell to me. Anybody else have that conclusion? So even people in hell know that Jesus is the Son of God. They didn't while they were alive, but they know now. And that every tongue should confess, which means agree with God, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Capital L, to the glory of God the Father. I think Philippians chapter 2, verse 11 is huge. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. So the next time you hear somebody say, Jesus Christ, what are you doing? <laughs> At the name of Jesus, every knee is going to bow. Just hit your knees. Stop traffic. Blasphemy. Just to use his name as a cuss word. Would you ever use your mother's name as a cuss word? No. Why? It's your mother. You honor your mother. Who's the one who gave you your mother and gave you you, the lungs, the air in your lungs, your abilities? His name is his name not above every name, at the na the na giving him the name above all names. Make a list of every name that you'd ever want to give a baby. Put it at the top, Jesus. It's the name above all names. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess to the glory of God the Father. He is Lord, not just a good prophet, not just a good teacher, not even just a healer. He's all those things. But he's Lord. And up until then, it was holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That's who you're talking to. But he, what, he humbled himself to be found in the appearance of a man. And again, I don't know what I would do if I was sitting there and, or one of you guys said, hey, you're looking at him. I'm like, hmm. You look pretty manly to me, you know. Like, I mean, so I mean, I don't want to fault these guys because this is a this is a they call it a horse pill, you know. Horse horse vitamins are pretty big, you know. Horse pill. I mean, if I had to swallow a horse vitamin, I'd probably have to chop it up a little bit. But this is a big, big theological nut. If you had to swallow this nut, you know. I mean, this is huge. And but again, later on he says, once they lift me up, and we talked about that in John chapter three. Um, we did that Wednesday night. It was a great study. But um, so he brings up the scriptures, and that's what, all we can do is bring up the scriptures. And again, he's the Son of God, the Son of God, capital S, Son of Man. Ezekiel uses that phrase, Son of Man, Son of Man. So that's another phrase that was used to be for the coming Messiah. Um, there's a lot of saviors through the book of Judges, but there's one capital S savior. God would send a judge, raise up a judge to save Israel out of their situation, but he's like the Savior, the Messiah, the Holy One of Israel. I mean, like none above him. He's special. Even like all our Old Testament heroes, Joseph was great, but he wasn't perfect. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Solomon, Samuel, David, you know, they all had flaws. They weren't perfect. We have one perfect one, Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah. So, I bring all this back to the mocking that not, all, not everybody has faith. And to the church, he's given each person a measure of faith. But there's verse that says not all have faith. That's the world. So we can't be too shocked when the world is doing things that the world does. Because that's just evidence that there's still work to do. There's still the gospel, good news to be shared. Hey, you know, whether you believe it or not, I mean, just the whole sexual sin, put that aside for a minute. 
you know, I, I, I've been watching the series from Ray Comfort, and they do a lot of street evangelism. It's on our channel, and I got 13 new episodes, so I finally watched the 11th. And you're always out on the beach talking to people. And Man, he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with this one African-American dude who thought reincarnation was real, and he's like, man, I, you know, we just keep coming back until you, you, know, you get it right. And, and he had this conversation. He didn't win him over by the end. He's like, how do you know? He says, because I've been here before. And I can, I can show you how to go back to some of your past lives. And, and, uh, and then he brought up Hebrews 9.27. It's been appointed unto men to die once and then face judgment. And that's, again, what our faith talks about. And he says, well, do you know anybody who's ever died and rose again? He says, no. And he says, well, that, that was Jesus. And he says, that sounds like something out of a movie. <laughs> You're right. It does. That's why it's a miracle. It's a miracle. Without God doing something supernatural, this is not natural that a man get be you know crucified and, and raised from the dead. So um, that's kind of where we're at. And and now this is right to give you context too. We just finished, we're halfway through Luke 13. We'll be picking up next week. Um, with sections 113 to 131. And basically, this is where um, he talks about the first shall be last and the last shall be first. The exalted shall be humbled and the humble shall be exalted. So the next few sections is where he starts uh, preparing the preparation of the disciples. So he's, again, now he's focusing on, uh, again, we're probably in the last six months of his life before he goes to the cross. If it's winter and he winds up being crucified on the Passover, which is usually around March or April in our calendar, right, based on the Hebrew calendar. He's probably got about four or five months left in his ministry uh, before he's crucified. So the last, bar, the last bit of the Gospels, they focus on what he was doing and what he wasn't doing. So I just want to say, too, if this is your, your church home, if you consider this your church home, you, you know, tithes and offerings, um, what you do with 10% of your giving is between you and God. In Malachi, he says, bring it into the storehouse so there's food in my house. It's kind of an indication where he expected the Jewish people to bring their tithes. This was 400 years before Christ, uh, 2,400 years ago. There wasn't a lot of government agencies back then taking care of widows and orphans, which the churches or the, the group of believers would take care of. And so now we have government programs for everything, uh, Medicaid, Medicare, and the list goes on and on. Free stuff, free stuff, free stuff. I just realized this year, this week, um, we partnered with a ministry called Genesis Gold Group, and they sell precious metals, gold and silver. And um, we looked at that in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8. Um, and he basically mentioned that where we're at as far as our country, our deficit is at $34 trillion. And every 90 days, the interest on $34 trillion every 90 days is another trillion dollars. And that's more money than our whole national defense budget for the year. And you can think about how many people are in the military and, and the gas it takes to run an aircraft carrier and those jets that are 30, 50, 60 million dollars each, all the bombs that we're dropping. I and mean, you just think about the national defense budget and everything it costs to run that. So just our debt itself, if we don't get a grip on that, it's gonna, it's, the money is gonna fail. This isn't, Jesus, uh, <laughs> Dave Ramsey, we did that class, Financial Peace University, some of us went through it twice, but it's a budgeting class. And if we don't get a grip of our finances, we can't be the hypocrite. We can't spend more than we make. What is that called? That's living on credit cards. And then, you know, now you're paying interest on credit cards. And, you know, I've done this a few times in my life. So again, I need to practice a budget too. But anyway, Larry Paquette, Crown Financial, would always say, save 10%, give 10%, and live on 80%. And if you can't live on 80%, you're living above your means. Because what do you, we all save for a rainy day. He said, Dave, Dave, don't be a pessimist. I'm not a pessimist. It's going to rain. Someone in your family is going to die. There's going to be a funeral. Something's going to happen. There's going to be a roof leak, a car break, a flat tire, something. And if you don't have money saved up for it, you're either going to have to borrow to get it done, and now you're a slave to the lender, and you're paying way more than what the tire costs because now you're adding, in some credit cards, 29% interest. 
to the cost of a tire. A hundred dollar tire, by the end of the year, if you don't pay it back, it's $129 for the tire. And they'll give you 10% off if you get their store credit card because you're going to want to pay in 29% more on the interest. These stores are, are making more money on the interest if you're not paying it right away than the, the margin of what they bought it for and sold you for, that little profit margin. They're making more money on the interest if you're not paying it back all the way. Everybody's in the banking business right now. And as a church, God honors those who honor him. And although your paycheck, even if your salary, I would say this. He goes on in Malachi 3 to say that, I'll make sure that the destroyer doesn't ravage your fields, that you're, the, the produce of your land. So there's a lot of little destroyers that could cause flat tires or things to break. Things will last longer. You'll find two for one, buy, buy two, buy one, get one, freeze. You'll find good deals of 30, 40% off on this. There's a lot of ways God can even take the 80% that you have and go a lot farther than you doing your best with 100% and not saving and not giving. So God loves a cheerful giver. That's the New Testament, you know, preface. And this isn't that. But as far as a teacher, and again, I preach what I need to hear the most. But as far as this organization, this ministry, uh, we don't have any debt. We just have very little overhead as far as operational expenses. But all the money that we have is going into the life, into, into changing lives. And uh, nobody, there's nobody on salary here. Nobody even gets paid unless we have an independent contractor do some work for like eight hours working on a swamp cooler, uh, they deserve to get paid if they're going to spend eight hours on the, on the sun in the middle of New Mexico in the summer. Anybody who fixes an AC, but eight hours is not a volunteer job. Vol if you volunteer for an hour or two, that's fine. If you're working four, five, six, 10, 12, 15 hours, that's a part-time job. We believe a worker is worthy of his wages. So we would never ask anybody to work for free, and nobody should ever ask you to work for free. It's not biblical. Say, man, I'm just trying to be biblical. God told me to be a, have a budget, and I have a family, and I've got things to take care of. And if I spend eight hours working for free, that's eight hours I couldn't work and make money to, to bless my family and to bless and to do what I need to do on a budget. You're actually, you know, again, unless God specifically talks to you about that, some people are independently wealthy and they can volunteer all kinds of, if they've retired and they're in that situation, every situation is different. But anyway, pushpay.com forward slash G forward slash Fruitland Christian Fellowship. If you want the Financial Peace University class again, I think we still have it for another month or so. And uh, anyone who wants to watch online, Fruitland Christian Fellowship, we're on Overcomers TV. We rebroadcast the last seven Sundays, every night at 9 p.m. Mountain to 10 p.m. You can also rewatch it on our YouTube channel, Facebook pages, audio. Um, I, this is an older slide from May, but Google turned into Amazon Music uh, as far as the nine platforms we're on. Google got away with their podcast. Apple, Spotify, iHeart, all that's still the same. Come join us on Wednesday nights. We do food and fellowship. Pick a topic. Um, it's all about living biblically. We Q&A. We do a lot of, it's more like fellowship. We, a lot of times we'll just eat together and hang out there. And we, you know, just people will come up with verses. We'll search it out and, and all that as well. And just a reminder too, as we talk about sharing the gospel with people, this is the last verse in chapter 15. I call it the resurrection chapter. There's going to be a resurrection. Jesus died and rose again to prove to you that you're going to die and you're going to rise again. That's the good news. Following Jesus, you might, your life might actually get worse between now and you dying. It could actually 100% get worse. In some countries, it could cost you your life. It could be an early grave. You could be one of the martyrs who died because you believe in Jesus. And Hebrews says that, those in Hebrews chapter 11, the second half, they weren't delivered. Some of them were sawn in two. They were cut in half. They were fed to the lions. They were beaten. And they get a better resurrection. Don't really know what that looks like. I thought the resurrection was a pretty good deal as it is. But having a better resurrection, if you, and again, you can't voluntarily throw yourself in front of the train and say, I'm dying for Jesus, and try to be a martyr. Or put on some dynamite and blow up some, some people and say, I'm dying for Jesus. That's a murderer. You know, you're murdering yourself and everybody with you. But if somebody's going to take your life for your faith in Jesus, you are technically a martyr like we talked about Stephen. But this is, at the end of explaining this whole resurrection, he ends with this. Therefore, my beloved brethren, that's you. If you're a believer in Christ, you're our beloved brethren. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for giving us time to huddle up and read your word and 
try to get our head around who you are and what you said, what you meant, and what that means to us and how we ought to live differently. So thank you, Holy Spirit, that you do direct our steps and you guide us and you brought us to where we are right now. And we have a decision to continue to follow you. And some have decided to follow you no more, like John chapter 6, verse 66, after you talked about eating my flesh, drinking my blood, has everlasting life, I'll raise him up on the last day, John 6, 54. And many of them didn't understand, and many disciples turned and follow you no more. So we pray for our brothers and sisters who've turned away from the faith, and we pray that you would help us have those conversations to whet their appetite, get them hungry and thirsty for righteousness, for your word, for a relationship with you. Help us to be on the lookout for that lost person who's so lost, if they died today, they would not be in your presence and spend eternity in hell. Help us to win them, win them over, win them into the kingdom, God. We know um, it's a search and rescue uh, mission at this point. So help us to be on the lookout and may we be uh, soul winners. Empower us, equip us by your spirit to be fishers of men like you said you'd make us fishers of men. Show us when we ought to go fishing. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. amen. You want to contact us as well, 505-374-8900, or you can shoot us an email at fruitlandchristianfellowship at gmail.com. If you are near Fruitland, Kirtland, or Farmington, uh, it's like a 10-mile radius there. You can probably swing by and see us, 701 County Road 6100, right next to the post office in Fruitland, New Mexico, across the street from Goldens. Until our next broadcast and service, may you and your families be blessed.